Uh, I have to just look at you for a moment before I start preaching. Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, and there are some of you that don't know me, and that's okay. Uh, I am Mark Bagwell. Uh, I had the honor and privilege 31 years ago, last Sunday night, to have about 30 people sitting in mine and Sheila's living room to share with them a vision that God had gave us about starting a new church in Oconee County. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And then 31 years ago today, we had our very first service under the gazebo over there. And we had went from 30 to 60 something in one week. (laughs) Man, I am telling you, I was so fired up. We had uh, an acoustic guitar that I believe came over on the ark. It was so old. (laughs) Tony Black was playing it, and we had a jam box. And for those of you too young to know what a jam box is, some of the older people will tell you what, you know, the boom box, you know. We had one of those, and man, we were going. We were going. I, uh, I found these hats. Uh, I think we got a picture of them. I found these hats uh, in my closet, and it's just, uh, uh, I know it comes back from the mid-90s because it has our original logo on it. The, the, I actually stole this logo, but now I will say this. We were one of the first churches to ever have a logo. You know, that just wasn't a thing uh, back in the 90s and stuff. But the South Carolina Baptist had a logo like this, the state, and had a cross through it. And so I just decided to cut that cross out, color in the corner where golden corner is, and stick the cross over it, and voila, we had a logo. And, uh, and our, actually, our original vision statement was loving God and loving people. Uh, so we had that on the back, and, and we were off. We were running. And so I'm just so, ex- so excited to be here uh, this morning. Don't we love the praise band here? Let's give them a great, great big hand. I know, I know we give God praise, but I give God praise for using them. And I do remember listening to Brock's voice from just, you know, him just being a young boy and listening to Tim you know, Tim was the closest thing to country music that I listened to when he was a little boy, you know, uh, because I listened to classic rock, and Tim come in with his big belt buckle, and he was, you know, man, he was singing and stuff, and this little lady right here, where does that volume come from? <laughs> you know, uh, I love to hear them, and Dylan, uh, I remember when Dylan was born, and uh and stuff, and now seeing him as a father, and I will say this, it was a great privilege of mine throughout all all the years to look at many of the people that's on stage right now, and realize that they had talent, and be able to pull them off to the side and say, please do not take for granted the talent that God has given you, and I pray that you use it for him for the rest of your life. Again, can y'all say it with me? Twala. Bam! Here it is. And God is using them in such a huge, huge way. It's such, such a blessing. Uh, I'm going to pray for us before I go into the sermon. And uh, as I start to pray, I'm going to ask you to do something. I've asked you to do this many times. uh, And I will continue to ask you to do this as I have the privilege of standing here uh, preaching. I've already been texting with Tim this morning. Uh, you know, and I and, and, and just told him, you know, what an honor and what a privilege it is. Yes, I was the founding pastor, but still, I have to be trusted by the pastor now to be able to stand here. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Tim doesn't take for granted whoever he calls and asks to stand before the sheep here now. And so I'm very, very honored to be standing here, honored to be standing here. And I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to pray. I'm going to ask you to ask the Lord to open up your mind, open up your ears, and open up your heart 
to hear what he has to say to you today. Because I am convinced from the youngest person to the oldest person here, God has something to say to you. And you don't want to miss that, do you? And it's not because of Mark Bagel. It's what God wants to say to you. And so would you pray that as I pray? This means yes. Okay? All right? Here we go. Let's pray. So, Father, here we are. And you know, Lord, my heart is running a thousand miles an hour. And, uh, Lord, I just... Uh, Stand here today, again, humbled for the opportunity to speak to this beautiful, beautiful church family. And I know, God, how excited you are about it. Just even early this morning, I could feel the excitement out of you, Lord, <clears throat> just flowing inside of me. And you've got a word to say today. You've got something that is very special to say into the hearts of all the men and women that are sitting here and so I pray, Lord, that you do use me, that you do speak through me, and that, God, each one of us, including myself, has the, the mind and the ears and the heart to hear what you would say to us today, and we'll thank you for it. We promise you we will not take it for granted. And I pray it in Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen, amen. amen. So a few months ago, I guess it was, Tim called me and asked me if I could, if I could uh, uh, preach uh, this Sunday, and actually this Sunday was open. This is the third Sunday in a row uh, that I have preached. A few weeks ago, I was in North Carolina uh, helping a church celebrate their 110th uh, anniversary, and it was a great celebration because literally thousands of people have come to know the Lord because of that church and so forth. And then uh, another church last week, and this week I'm here. And uh, so I said, Tim, I said, what would you like for me to preach on? And he said, how great God is. And I went, okay. All right, you know, how great God is. And I said, can we throw in there how great God's love is too? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we can do that and everything. So I started setting down, preparing a sermon to share with you. And I, like Tim and like Ronnie, we love to what? Go into God's Word and tell you a story, right? You know, and then pull that story together and stuff. So how many stories are there in the Bible about how great God is? Oh, I was not going to be any problem from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I was just going to be able to choose one. And I'd choose one, and I'd read it, and I'd say, this is it. And God'd say, nah. So I said, okay, we got time. Boom. So we'd go to another one. I think he was just wanting me to go from Genesis to Revelation, you know, just spend more time with him. Because it wasn't till about last week that sitting on my back porch, and I was sort of getting a little anxious, you know, Lord, you got to give me what I'm going to give them and everything. And finally, God said, you're going to preach about how great I am. He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to look at them and say, you are the greatness of God. You want me to say this? Let me say it this side over here. You are the greatness of God. Now, I'm not saying, don't, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that you are a great God. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. You are the greatness of God. How great is our God. Sing with me. I'm telling you, when we were singing that just then, I was thinking back to that gazebo morning and thinking of where we are today. I was thinking about how over the last 31 years, God has opened the door for Sheila and I to travel all over the world in so many places, be around so many Christian people, and hear them sing that song in their language. Well, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Can you imagine? I wish I could do it. But y'all would just think I was speaking in tongues, and you know, I mean... But just imagine the Swahili sound, uh, the, the uh, Japanese sound, the Spanish sound, the, the different languages singing, how great is our God. And the reason we can do that is God's most precious creation. You know, God spoke the whole world into existence. And then God come down and he took dirt and he made Adam and he blew his breath into Adam, and he's, he's always looked at us as his greatest, greatest creation and his greatness. 
63 years ago this August, a lady named Joyce Bagwell gave birth to me. Now, God wove me in her womb, and he made me. And the Bible says that when God makes us, he weaves us in our mother's womb, and then he has a purpose for us. And, and she gave birth, and I was the son of Joyce and, and Ralph Bagwell. And I was raised in their home, fortunately in a, in a church home where my dad was pastoring and, and so forth. And then about the, 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 the age of eight, I felt God sort of touching my shoulder, reaching out to me. And I remember going home from school one day and telling my mom about it. Lynn, mom, what, there's something going on inside of me. She just gave me this big smile. And she said, I know what it is. You need to ask Jesus into your life. And now dad was in Kentucky preaching a revival because I probably would have went to dad. Because dad's the one that taught me all the Bible stories and stuff. But now let me go on and say this. After that moment, for years and years and years and years, the mom, my mom is the one that taught me to really fall deeply in love with Jesus. To love people, to pray, to, to just be that, that Christian person. And, but we went and we went into her bedroom and we sat down and mom went through the Romans road to salvation. You ever heard of that? And it just leads you to that place. And finally, the question is, now, Mark, do you want to ask Jesus into your life? And I said, yes, ma'am, I do. And I remember us there at Rehoboth Baptist Church uh, 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 Pastorum. We knelt down beside the bed, and I asked Jesus into my life. And a journey began for me. And it was just thinking back on it now. So we moved on. We moved here to Oconee County, and it was in the mid '90s. Uh, by well, not, not the mid '90s, uh, the mid '70s by then, and stuff. And I was on the back end of the hippie days, and I wanted to grow my hair long. And I'm telling you, the reason God does not let me have hair now or play an instrument is because I would probably still be trying to be in a rock and roll band somewhere, you know. I mean, he let my hair start falling out when I was a senior in high school, you know, that was, but I wanted to grow my hair long, I wanted to, you know, because music moved me. So God was just laying everything into place. So I get about 15 or 16 years old, and we go to the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, every year, that was our vacation, the Southern Baptist Convention, <laughs> Just being honest, just being honest. Hey, I'm Southern Baptist. I love those guys and everything and, and, and stuff. But, but that was our, I mean, but you know why? Because the church paid for it. And so I don't care if it was in Texas or St. Louis or Atlanta, wherever it was, that's where I remember us driving a 62 Chevrolet with an air condition that did not work and a hole in the back floorboard about this big to Dallas, Texas. In June. But that's where it was. So that's where we went. Oh, I wish I could tell you all those stories. But in the mid-70s, 75, 76, the, the Southern Baptist Convention was at Norfolk, Virginia. And thankfully for me and my best friend, Chuck Weaver, at the time, thankfully for us, Dad procrastinated, and he could not get rooms in Norfolk, so he had to get rooms at Virginia Beach. I can still remember today, I'm 63 years old, and I can remember pulling up to the first red light, and these girls walked by in bathing suits toward us, and me and Chuck looked at each other and said, God does love us. <laughs> oh my gosh, this was going to be great. Oh, it was going to be great, you know. So we ate supper that night, got up next morning, and mom and dad took off to Norfolk, and all 110 pounds of me Got to go out on the beach, you know, at that time, and uh, me and Chuck, and we had a great day all day, and Dad come home, and, you know, I had to ask, well, how was the convention, Dad? Like, I really cared. I did not, you know, and everything, and he was like, it was great, Mark. It was really good, and everything, and he said, I want you and she, uh, you're not you and Sheila, I not Sheila yet. You and Chuck, I want you and Chuck to go to the convention with me tomorrow, and I went, no way. 
are you kidding me, Daddy? No way. And he said, no, 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 no. I want you to go to the convention with me. He said, there's, there's shipyards out in Norfolk, and I want to take a break and show you those. And so we negotiated. And we finally figured out that me and Chuck would go with them in the morning. We would stay for the morning session. At lunch, we would go look around a little bit. They would bring us back to the beach, and then they'd go back for the evening session. Okay, good compromise, right? Right, right. We get to the convention center, and uh, I'm seeing everybody that we've known for years and stuff, and, and we go into the part where the convention is going to be held, and I look up on stage, and there's a set of drums, there's an electric guitar, there's a bass guitar, there's some trumpets, there's several microphones, and I'm thinking, we're in the wrong section of the convention center. This is, this is not where the Southern Baptist with the organ and the piano is meeting. I, I, this is wrong. But I look around, and all these pastors and their wives come walking in, and they sat down. And all of a sudden, they had led a group called Truth. Has anybody ever heard of Truth? A few of you. Uh, again, this was back in the mid-70s. One of the very first contemporary groups ever, it was a bunch of college students, they come walking out on stage. And I'm telling you, the guys had on plaid pants with those cuffs. Y'all remember? And the sort of plaid. The girls had on mini dresses, but they were really about right here, you know. Some of the guys had afros and stuff. And they come walking out. They told them that they could do two songs pre-sessional. That means it's not in the minutes that you're actually playing, you know. But they told them they could do two songs and stuff. And I remember with all my heart, that guitar started playing, the drums started playing, the bass started playing, and they grabbed those microphones and they started singing and stuff. And I thought God was going to kill us all. <laughs> I thought, oh, God's just going to shoot lightning bolts down and just kill all the Southern Baptist Convention. <gasps> It was a band. It was crazy. The song ended, and I looked around, and we were still there. And before I knew it, me and Chuck had stood up, and we were going <laughs> like this. And everybody else sitting around us was going, <laughs> you know, and oh, my goodness. And then they sung another song. And I'm telling you, I would have got on the bus and left with them that day if I could have. I got so excited, I couldn't stand it. Now, guys, you know what got excited in me? I didn't realize it then. But do you know what got excited in me? It was the Holy Spirit living inside of me. And there was Christian music. There was Christian words that was coming out of these young people's voice. And, and it almost sounded like rock and roll. It almost did, you know, and, and stuff. And I was just like, why? And I really believe that that day God said to me, if I ever use you, Mark, in a full-time ministry, we're going to use that kind of music. Now years pass. And finally, around the early 80s, a, 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 a radio station called WLFJ in Greenville started. And uh, people like Carmen and Petra and, and some of the others. Finally, Stephen Curtis Chapman came out and, and so forth. And, and they started playing this more contemporary type music and it was moving me. Now, before you don't hear again, well, I love hymns. I do love hymns. I love choirs. I love, I love anything that's done well for the Lord. I love bluegrass. I love country, sort of. I, I love, I love, though, music that worships the Lord. I, I mean, I, I'll tell you, I drove an hour and a half to that church in North Carolina. I listened to the Gaithers all the way there. I knew I was going to more of a traditional church, so I was going to get in, you know, sort of that mode and stuff. And I'm just, I sung all those old hymns with them all the way to North Carolina. I love that. But that contemporary music was moving in me. And, and finally, I became a, a, a volunteer youth minister. I was teaching Sunday school. 
Uh, I become a Gideon. Y'all know what the Gideon is? The Gideon Bibles and stuff. And used to, we had Gideons come and speak at churches and tell about how they give Bibles out across the world. I become a Gideon. I start speaking for them. And I enjoyed that. Uh, my dad had retired and he was doing interim work in different places. And every once in a while, he would ask me to speak for him on Sunday morning. So I thought I would do that. And all of a sudden, this nudging started happening inside of me about maybe becoming a full-time minister. <laughs> and I did not want to. I did not. I wanted to become a millionaire. I wanted to become governor of South Carolina. Bless y'all that I never did. <laughs> My wife has followed me in anything I took us to do except for politics. She was like, no way, Jose. But I told God how much I could do for him with those millions of dollars that I was going to make. You ever been there before? Lord, do you just know what the tithe is on a million dollars? Like he didn't. And if I multiply that, oh, God, I can do all these things. But then I would ask my dad. I would say, Dad, how will I know if God's calling me? And his answer would be the exact same thing every time. You know what it would be? You'll know. You will know, Mark. I'm at a revival service in, at Maranatha Church here in Seneca one week, and, and man, I really start feeling that drawing, and I'd go home, and me and God, we'd get into it. We'd have an argument about it. I mean, God, you really don't, you know, call my brother to preach. He's a lot smarter than I am and stuff. There's one part I left out about the uh, story that I need to tell you when I said Mike's a lot smarter than me. Uh, he is, really. He's a brilliant guy. Um, but in the third grade, uh, I was struggling, struggling reading, struggling. And to the point to where my third grade teacher and the principal of the school told my mom and dad uh, to take me to Greenville to be tested. And I had a thing called dyslexia. And they didn't know how to diagnose it back then, though. They, they knew something was going on, but they just didn't have a word for it or, or whatever and stuff. And, and, uh, and so we went, and when we did, they took me in. I don't remember anything about that day except for it was a big building, which was intimidating, and, and going in that hallway. It was a big hallway. Now, I remember a lady taking me into another room, but that's all I remember. I don't remember the test. I don't remember nothing. But I do know this, that when the tests were over, uh, the lady left me in the room playing with something. She came out and she looked at my mom and dad and said, you know, I've really enjoyed meeting your son today. He has a great personality. I, I like Omar, but there's something you really need to know. He'll probably never graduate high school. So we got in the car and my dad looked at my mom and said, we'll see about that. And immediately, they started getting me tutors. And can I look at you and say, I loved it? And there were a lot of reasons. I'd go to one lady. Both of them were retired teachers, older teachers. I loved it because I would go to one lady two days a week, and then I would go to the other lady two days a week, and they made great brownies <laughs> and cookies. I'm just telling you, and they knew how to motivate a little kid because I would walk in, and I could smell them, and I knew if I did my lessons well and if I'd done my homework and made them proud, I felt like and everything, and I mean like the last 20 minutes, we would just sit there together and we would just eat brownies and stuff, and I'd get all sugared up and they would send me home because <laughs> I was a little ADD too. It was great though. But I even realized in the third grade, oh man, I can actually start putting words together. Because even back then I was worried, this is not good that you can't read, you know. And uh, you know when I found out that story, the whole story that I just told you, uh, the explanation, you know when I found that out? <laughs> The night I graduated on that football field in 1979, May 27th, my mom and dad told me that story. 
They never told me <laughs> up to that time. Whoo. Now I didn't I didn't graduate a magna cum laude. <laughs> but I was accepted to Anderson Junior College, and we were headed that way, man. We were headed that way. That's part of the story, and I need to just jump back and tell you that. In that revival, though, finally about the third night during the invitation, I, I really felt that I needed to make it public. And so I walked up to the altar one more time to negotiate with God one more time. Come on, God. Are you really sure you want me to do this? And my middle son, Drake, was just a little boy at the time. And he just followed me up to the altar. And I knelt down. And he knelt down beside me here. And Drake was just crying. He was just squalling. And I put my arms around him. And I said, Drake, are you okay? Why are you crying? I don't know, Daddy. I don't know. I said, is there something I can pray for you about? I, I mean, I really felt a little strange asking a little bitty kid like that, is something I can pray for you about? But that's the only thing I could think of to say. And he was like, I don't know, Daddy. I don't know. And it hit me. What was going on with Drake was the Holy Spirit was so on me, so full. It was, it was oozing out, actually. And that little innocence of Drake, y'all following me, was catching it. And all he could do was cry with it. You ever been that close to God? You ever felt that close with God that the only thing you can do is just cry? It's not a torment cry, it's just a cry. And I said, God, okay, I'm yours. Ever what you want, Lord. My life is an open book to you. Whatever you want. And I looked at it. Drake was going. <laughs> he was, the crying was done. And he was just smiling at me. And I was like. Oh God man. You are so real. So. I uh, moved on a little bit. And I started pastoring a little church. In Westminster called Toxway. It's almost on the Georgia line. Started off with 19 people there. And. Less than two years, we were running about 130, and I was already sort of using a little contemporary music along with our hymns and stuff, and, and I was sitting in the rocking chair, and I'm getting to a point, guys, stick with me, okay? I'm getting to a place. I was sitting in the rocking chair at, 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 in our, in our uh, uh, kitchen, and it was late at night, and I felt like God said, I want you to start a new church, Mark, and I said, God... There's already over 60 Southern Baptist churches in Oconee County. Why do I need to be starting a new Southern Baptist church? And he said, Mark, you know that's not the kind of church. The doctrine, yes, but not that kind of church that I'm, I'm wanting you to start. And we started talking about using more contemporary type music and, and throwing some skits in there and stuff and, and being a church where people could come just as they are. They could wear their blue jeans. They could wear their t-shirts. They could even wear their shorts if that's what they was going to wear. And I'm telling you, I said this over and over again in the beginning, and we're not going to even care what they've done on Saturday night. They are still going to be welcomed at Golden Corner. They may have got drunk. They may have got high. They may have had sex with someone they should not have had that with. But when they step in the door on Sunday morning, they will be welcome. That's what we was going to start. I'm telling you, it was so exciting. Have you ever been at that place where your wife is asleep, men, or men, uh, or your husband's asleep and everything, and you really want to tell them something? You know? And finally, when Sheila woke up, I was looking at her. Like this, I said, Sheila, I got to tell you something. And then I started telling her the whole thing. You know what she said to me? She said, I've known that for a long time, Mark. I've just been waiting on you to hear it. <laughs> Which was very, very true. Very true. So I called a guy named Tony Black because he had been working at me. And that's Jake's dad. You know, Tony's in heaven now. The first time me and Tony met, I said, Tony, I heard you could play the guitar real well. What can you play? And he said to me, uh, Mark, if you can sing it, I can play it. Now, we were in Hardy's in Westminster. I almost went over the table and kissed him right in the lips right then. 
I thought that was the grandest thing. You mean you can do that? I can sing it too and you can play it? And he's like, yeah, 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 I can do it. And so I went to Tony and I told him about this new church. And I said, Tony, I want you to pray about starting this new church with me. He's the only one I went to and asked to help me start the church. I want you to pray about it. And he said, Mark, I, we've been praying about God doing something in our lives. Why don't I have to pray about it? Let's do it. And so immediately we started writing old rock and roll songs, changing the lyrics. Everything from Leonard Skinner to the Eagles to we didn't know it was against the law back then. And we'd sing a hymn, and then we would sing a Skinnerd song. You know? Uh, we, who's that? Can't you see? Can't you see what my Savior has done for me? Okay? Not what that woman done to me or whatever, but you know? Woo! I'm telling you, and people just started coming. And people started getting saved. What an amazing ride that was. And I could tell you so much more. And Golden Corner back then is the same Golden Corner today. And what I mean by that is we done things so much bigger than who we are. The citywide Easter egg hunts where we would, we would hide 10,000 Easter eggs over at the depot grounds. Uh, the fall carnivals, the, the puppet show things that we done. The, and people would come and say, what other churches are working with you? And we'd say, oh, it's just us. And they would say, I didn't know that a church your size could do this. And you know what? A church our size on our own ability could not, but through the power of God. Did y'all listen to what you sung today? Did you hear that God takes a shepherd boy and turns him into a giant killer? And today... 31 years ago today, Golden Corner is still doing bigger things than you are. And you know why you're doing it? Because we serve a great God. And God dreams God-sized things. And He takes a group of 12 guys and He changes the world. And He takes a group from Little Wahala. South Carolina, that's sending out over 93 missionaries to do mission work this year. That's what y'all are doing. Mm-hmm. I did think I would get a couple of more amens out of that. <laughs> over 93 out to do missions this year. Bam. Ugh. Woo. Do you know Sheila and I went to a Luther for 18 years straight? When we started going to a Luther, I said, God, we need to go someplace that's close. We need to go someplace we can afford because we're a bunch of blue-collar people. And we need to go someplace we can go year after year so we can build relationships. And guess what? Bam! A Luther whew, fell into our laps. And there we went. Some of the kids that we led to the Lord at Bible Club are bringing their kids to your Bible clubs that you're leading in a Lutheran now. Their kids. How great is our God? It's like this. Have you ever walked outside and looked at the stars? <laughs> ba boom! Have you ever looked outside and looked at the stars? And you're standing there and you're literally looking at millions of stars and you are so mesmerized at what you're looking at. But then all of a sudden you realize that you're only looking at a very small part of the massive massiveness of everything that makes up all of those stars and the solar system. So you're looking at a little part and you're mesmerized. You're, it's great, but there's so much more. How many of you have ever been to the Grand Canyon before? Grand Canyon? I'm telling you what, there is nothing like standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon and looking at it, and you're going, <gasps> and then all of a sudden you realize that beyond what you can see this way and beyond what you can see this way is still greatness of the Grand Canyon. Have you ever stood on the shore of an ocean and looked out? toward it 
and, and you can see it, and again, you're mesmerized at how vast and how big it is, and it looks like it's just falling off the end of the earth, but you realize you're just seeing a small portion of it. And that's how great, though, it is that God has made. One last slide. Have you ever looked at a picture of the body that is just the blood vessels and, and then you see an, another picture that's got the, the, the muscles and, and, and all of that stuff and all the organs? And I've talked with doctors and doctors say to me this. They say, Mark, as much as we know about the body, we still know that we don't know so much about the body. You know why? Because God made the body. God made the universe. God made the Grand Canyon. God made the oceans. And God made you. And 63 years ago, when Mark Bagwell was born, he knew that you would be sitting in Golden Corner Church today. And it excited him back then as much as it excites him today that you are here. When we started Golden Corner Church 31 years ago in that little gazebo, he knew that we would be sitting here today and you would be here. Just like the vastness of things we cannot see, he already saw them. And you are a part of that. Greatness of God brings us to the great love of God. And in the last three to four minutes, I'm going to end with this. When God created Adam and Eve, like I said, he came down and he actually made them. He didn't just speak them into existence. He blew his own breath into them. And when he did, he would come in the mornings and in the evenings. He would walk with them and he built them to have an intimate relationship with them. But then they did sin. Because he gave them a free will. And God wants us to love him because we want to love him. Not because he's forcing us to love him. You understand that? He wants us to, just like your spouse wants you to love them because you want to love them. And they sinned against God. And God came down. And you remember, you remember the story. He said, hey, where are you? Where are you? And Adam said, we're hiding because we're naked. And he said, who told you that you were naked? And then he goes, oh, well, hey, you know, that woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit and we ate it. And then she says, well, you know the serpent. Y'all know, know how the story went. And God said, because of this, you can't stay in the garden anymore. Now, y'all hold on to what I'm saying here. You can't stay in the garden. And what did he do? He made the first sacrifice, and I'm telling you why. It says right there that he would stomp the head of Satan one day. He started putting redemption in the plan so that we could have salvation through Jesus Christ. Immediately, he started doing that. He put clothes on them. He took them out of the garden. And what does the Bible say? He closed the doors and he put the angels there where they couldn't go back in. But the thing you have to realize is God didn't stay inside. He could have stayed in the garden and looked over the wall and said, hey, good luck. But he did not. He walked out with them. He closed those doors and he said, okay, here we are together. And thousands of years later, he is still right here with us. In this soul, sinful, dirty world, God is still with his creation that he loves so intimately. I look at it like this. Can you put that picture of the triangle up there? I look at it like this. Please understand this. The most intimate and most beautiful relationship in the entire universe is through the God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They love each other intimately. And this is what he's done. He's invited us to be right in the middle of that relationship. 
If you took a pen and said, where does God want us in that beautiful relationship, you would put a dot right in the middle. Not on the outside anywhere, but right in the middle. That's how much he loves us. I I, I say this all the time. God does not just love. Love is what God is. That's what he is. And he's invited us to be right in the middle of that relationship and he done it through his son Jesus I heard a preacher just a little while back that said this I sat with my son as he died my wife sat there my children sat there but as his father I sat there and I watched him as he took his last breaths and there was nothing I could do nothing I could do maybe you've experienced that before and he said after that though I started realizing That my Savior Father sat in heaven and he looked at his son dying for us. And it wasn't that he couldn't do anything. He chose not to. So that our sins could be paid for. So that his greatest creation could not only just have an abundant life here on this earth. But have life eternal with him in heaven he wants you there he wants you there in Romans 8 38 through 39 it says this for I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you know there's nothing you can do to make God stop loving you? That's a good statement, isn't it? I'm going to say that again, and I'm going to get these amens that I'm looking for. There is nothing you can do to make God stop loving you. And if you ever hear that, if you ever hear that, you have to understand that the Holy Spirit would never whisper those kind of words to you, that you're not loved by God. Only the adversary would whisper those ears uh, into your ears. And at that time, you just say, ah, 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 no, 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 no. In the name of Jesus, I do not need to hear that. I will not listen to that. One more scripture for you. Because he loves us and we are his great creation. Ephesians 3, 18 through 19 says, I pray that you and all God's holy people will have the power to understand the greatness of Christ's love. How wide and how long, how high and how deep that love is. Now listen to this last verse. Christ's love is greater than anyone can ever know. But I pray that you will be able to know that love. Then you can be filled with the fullness of God, the greatness of God. To reach that great potential that God has for you, that He created in you in your mother's womb. Ask Jesus into your heart. Let the Holy Spirit become alive inside of you. And then this is what happened to you. I asked, uh, I asked Brock to sing How Great Is Our God. So that's a contemporary song. Let me sing this one to you. Okay, everybody take a deep breath. Y'all with me? Because I want you to receive this. Oh, this is my story. This is my song. What? Praising my Savior all the day long. Oh, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. That last verse says, perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior, in my, not and my Savior, but in my. You know, Jesus prayed, one of his last prayers was, Father, he just got through praying for the disciples. Now he's praying for us. He said, 
He said, Father, since I am in you and you are in me and they are in us, talking about us, are in me, therefore they are in us. Let me say that again. I am in you, you are in me, they are in me, therefore they are in us. So that line says, I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above. Oh, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. Bow your heads with me. I'm going to sing to you again. You can sing with your heads bowed if you want to. Oh, this is my story. This is my song. Oh, you want to do this? Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Father, what an incredible time it's been to reminisce. And Lord, I know that everybody in this congregation has stories that they can look back on and see those milestones of where you moved in their life to bring them to this very place today. Before I, end, I finish this prayer, I'm going to do this. I have to do this. I can't take for granted that everyone sitting here is a Christian. If you don't know Christ in your life, as soon as I get through praying this prayer, i got to let you go. The next group has to get in. But would you come and speak to me? And let's talk about you asking Christ into your life. <laughs> what a gift you would give yourself today by doing that. So, Lord, we do feel like your great creation. We do feel your love and your blessings. And if there's someone here today that's not feeling that, Lord, I pray that in the name of Jesus, Satan can't steal that from them no more because you do love them deeply. Let us be in awe of your greatness. And I pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen. Amen. God bless you. You guys have got to scram. We got to get the next group in. <laughs>